Good evening and thank you for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Parikshit Lutra and with me is my colleague Ashmit Kumar. Hi Ashmit. Uh, the tensions in the Middle East, especially after what happened between US and Iran, continues to dominate global headlines and it's affecting markets as well. Indeed, the markets are trying to understand as to what value, what number they should put uh, to the risk that is associated with this uh, tension that is building up in the Middle East. And that is what the market seems to be struggling with, resulting in what we essentially have uh, is, is, is an 800-point dive, uh, essentially is what market experts are calling it, the biggest single-day dive uh, for almost a year now. Let's, in fact, head straight into the Lal Street. Uh, again, the biggest sell-off in recent months, nearly 3 lakh crore rupees worth of investor wealth was lost um, uh, amidst uh, the geopolitical tensions in the Middle East and a rapid rise in crude oil prices, forcing the bulls to run for cover on the Lal Street. Now, the Sensex lost nearly 800 points, posting its worst single-day fall in nearly a year. The Nifty fell below the 12,000 mark to post its worst fall in six months. Uh, bank stocks led the route with Nifty Bank Index losing nearly 3%. Uh, there was simply no place to hide with even the mid caps and the small caps uh, getting battered. Five stocks declined for every advancing stock and every sectoral index ended in the red. Anuj Singhal is here with the day's market action. Anuj, uh, tell us what sparked off the sell-off and what can we expect tomorrow morning when the opening bell strikes? ugly day for the Indian markets today because the markets now have to deal with a fresh risk, geopolitics. And the issue with geopolitics is that it's one of the one of those risks which is tough to measure. You don't know whether it's going to stop today or seven days and what kind of price damage it will entail. A collateral damage is what's happening to crude prices with Brent crude past the $70 mark. That itself is a challenge for Indian market apart from what's happening with the geopolitics. And also keep in mind the market positioning. On Friday morning, the market was sitting at the cusp of a new all-time high and then this news hit us. So obviously, the positioning was different. Market needed any trigger to correct and the market got one in form of geopolitics. Uh, in terms of today's trade, well, it was brutal. Advanced decline, well in favor of declines, massive selling in large financials, the bluest of blue chips, SBI, Bajaj Finance, all these stocks uh, falling quite a bit, Bajaj Finance after failing to meet its own gold standards. Well, uh, and you know, across the board, you saw quite a bit of selling. So obviously, the question that now comes to mind is, should this correction be bought into? And what's next for the market? Well, one thing which you have to tell yourself is that even though six months down the line, you could, with the benefit of hindsight, say that this was a great buying opportunity, right now, you have to ask yourself, is this getting over tomorrow? Perhaps not. And in that case, there's no brownie point for getting the, the bottom of the market right. It's important to see if either US or Iran is showing signs of backing down. Crude prices need to be watched very carefully. We need to see the FII action, whether they are getting into risk of mode. So there are a lot of variables uh, that you need to take into account. This is not a market in which technicals work. Uh, and you know, at this point, I'm really reminded of one of my favorite quotes from one of my all-time favorite movies, 21 always account for variable change. We've had a variable change. If you take that point of view that you stay away till the dust settles, I think uh, you'll probably be staying away for the entire next 100 years. Uh, there, there is no dust settling in the in the stock market. Uh, it doesn't happen like that. There'll always be some sort of issue or, uh, or the other. Um, the sensible way to make money in India over the last 12 months, the last 10 years, the last 20 years has been by high-quality companies clean corporate governance, strong cash flows, good balance sheets, strong competitive advantages. Whether uh, uh, there is issues in the Middle East or whether there is issues back home in India, it, is, it seldom matters uh, uh, unless, uh, as, as long as you, as long you, as you invest sensibly, it seldom matters what the macro issues are. The market is already discounting a pretty meaningful recovery in earnings in FI21. So it's not like the market's saying, uh, at low levels, not discounting good news. So, yes, the economic fundamentals have recently started to turn positive, but the market's well ahead of those fundamentals. Uh, therefore, uh, I think uh, from a valuation standpoint, uh, there is value in the mid and small caps, not in the large, some of the large cap names. Uh, so I think it's going to be a bit of a mixed bag. And uh, U.S.'s deteriorating ties with Iran and Iraq on the back of the assassination of top Iranian commander Soleimani has sent oil prices soaring. The Iraqi parliament 
has passed a resolution asking its government to end the presence of foreign troops from the country. This has triggered a response from the White House as well. President Donald Trump has threatened to impose sanctions on the Middle Eastern nation. Meanwhile, Iran has said that it would no longer abide by the uranium enrichment limits under the 2015 nuclear deals. Manisha Gupta joins us now. Manisha, how are you uh, looking into these developments? Where do you see oil prices heading? Well, it's the second straight day when we have seen the crude oil prices jump up and if you look at the Brent prices, they are trading at a four-month highs while the NYMEX crude is trading at a 14-month highs. We have seen uh, the tensions between US and Iran continue. There has been a rhetoric that has been ongoing from Iraq, from Iran and US as well. The street is divided into two parts. One believes that the worst is yet to come and uh, we might be looking at a retaliation coming in from Iran or Iraq. Both the countries have pretty much said that and US also uh, not uh, staying behind says that they will um, make this appropriate uh, disproportionate attacks rather and they have narrowed down on 50 and more of Iran uh, areas where they could actually uh, have further attacks being done so yes it, it's not over as yet and if you look at Saudi Arabia Iran and Iraq these three major uh, oil producers produce 15 million barrels per day of a crude and that is where the premium is coming in from in case of the crude oil price where we have seen nearly 9% of gains in the past one month. We have seen nearly 6% of gains in the, in the month of Jan until now in 2020. So if there's an escalation, then you perhaps are looking at the crude oil prices running further up from here. Uh, experts say that you could be looking at targets of 80, 90, and there isn't really a ceiling there. But if this dies down and there is not too much done and it is only rhetoric that follows in the next few days, then we might be looking at some consolidation coming in for the crude oil prices. The other big trigger, of course, would also be the U.S. and China trade deal signing, which is happening on 15th of Jan in U.S. That also is going to be quite supportive for the crude oil prices. So no one really is telling you to sell crude prices from here. It is going to be a range between 68 to 75 if it continues the way it is right now. If there's an escalation, then we are looking at much higher prices from here. Right, Panisha, thanks a lot for that. So the band continues to remain the 68 to 75. That's the band that we're looking at. But in fact, taking the same story forward, uh, slipping in a global picture. Let's go across to NBC News' uh, Richard Angel, who gets us the latest on the escalating uh, tensions between the United States on one hand and Iran and Iraq on the other. First, let's start out with what's going on in Iran. These are the biggest demonstrations, funeral processions that this country has seen in decades. Uh, Iranian state TV says there are millions of people uh, who have gone out onto the streets to mourn the top general who was killed in a drone strike here in Iraq by, uh, the, by the United States. Uh, they're actually the biggest demonstrations since the death of the Islamic Republic's founder, Ayatollah Khomeini. So this is a, a very important moment for Iran, and yet again we're hearing more promises from Iranian leaders, including the slain general successor, that there will be acts of revenge, but no specificity provided. Here in Iraq, there is the, the fallout of the political decision, the Iraqi parliament voting yesterday to request that the government kick out U.S. forces. Uh, there are about 5,000 U.S. troops here. But there is a, um, a constitutional question whether the parliament, whether this current prime minister, who in fact resigned in November, has the authority to uh, expel U.S. forces. So it may at this stage be a symbolic vote, but that is certainly the direction that things seem to be heading. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people here, a lot of Shia in this country who are the majority, uh, think that the United States, President Trump, overstepped his bounds. That, are, that the U.S. is now treating Iraq like a, a personal playground where they can come and carry out assassinations or targeted killings or however you want to describe the action uh, when, when the official reason that U.S. troops are here is to fight ISIS, not to fight some proxy war with Iran. So as geopolitical tensions rise and lead to a spike in crude oil prices, what kind of impact will it have on the Indian economy? Will it lead to a sharp surge in India's import bill? And could that translate into higher inflation and lower growth, impacting RBI's rate decision? We caught up with SBI Group's uh, Chief Economic Advisor, Somikanti Ghosh, to find out the answers. Here's what he had to say. Even the fact that oil has moved from below 65 to 70, there will be obviously some impact on current account deficit and possibly growth, 
which is already weak. I mean, whenever oil prices in the past has been actually impacted more by geopolitical realities. So if it's a geopolitical reality and not global growth concerns, then a surge in the oil prices may not be may not impact the decision of the, for example, the RBI in terms of rates. Well, here's one news trigger that the markets will be watching very carefully. First, advance estimates of the FY20 GDP will be released tomorrow. Uh, the number comes at a time when the rate of growth has uh, slipped to 4.5% in the second quarter, and the RBI has cut its growth target for the full fiscal to just 5%. Uh, so what should one expect from tomorrow's estimate? Well, Lata decodes that for us. Take a look. That's right. The first advance estimates are going to be announced of uh, the FY20 GDP. The, uh, a survey we did indicates that it's only going to be 5% real GDP. If you add inflation, GDP plus inflation would be, that would give you the nominal GDP. That is expected to rise uh, by 7.5%. Now, the nominal GDP is normally mentioned in the budget. In the FY20 budget, the one that was presented in June, the Nirmala Sitaraman budget, had estimated that the current year's nominal GDP will grow by 12%. And so the overall... The, 12% growth of the GDP nominal number will be 211 trillion or 211 lakh crore. But now that uh, the expectation is it will grow only by 7.5%, that total GDP number will be more like 202 or 203 trillion rupees. That is important because the fiscal deficit is calculated on that number. So because the fiscal deficit remains the same, about 7 lakh crore, but the GDP itself is likely to be smaller than originally estimated. You're going to get arithmetically a higher fiscal deficit uh, if the GDP number comes in as low as 202, 203 lakh crore. We, it arithmetically becomes a 3.5% fiscal deficit. But more importantly, uh, you know, how does the uh, CSO arrive at this figure? The CSO has only two quarters of GDP. You know, Q1 and Q2 has been announced so far. Q3 GDP number is not known to the CSO. It's not yet calculated. They have the IIP and the core sector numbers for October and November. And then they have a few advance estimates like, you know, auto sales, coal. Uh, coal India puts out that number. Then uh, power, the uh, Central Electricity Authority puts out a power number. And of course, there's uh, loan growth, which RBI puts out. If you uh, looked at the uh, October, November IIP and core, then economists tell us, that the Q3 GDP will be even lower than uh, Q2. Q2 was, if you remember, 4.5. Four, four so it, this guy can come at even 4.4. But the December numbers have been good uh, in terms of coal and electricity and even some auto sales. But December loan growth has been bad. If we assume a better December number, then maybe we will get up to 4.5. So under any circumstances, it's very difficult for the CSO to put out a uh, real GDP more than 5% and a nominal GDP higher than 75 uh, It's very surprising. So this will be some kind of a decadal low in terms of numbers. More importantly, it's, uh, uh, you know, it also means it becomes the basis for projecting next year's budget. To that extent, the government will be also handicapped in terms of what it can assume for next year's GDP growth. In any case, uh, I must put one caveat on the table. These advance estimates are becoming increasingly a little pointless. In, the, in days of, you know, three, four years ago, when the budget was presented on Feb 28, the advance estimates used to come on Feb 7th. So at that time, at least the government had, you know, nine full months of data, three full quarters of GDP before they projected the full year. Now they have just two quarters and maybe two months. So this advance estimate is somewhat less uh, reliable than uh, in the past. It, it's, uh, uh, it just becomes an exercise to feed into the budget. It has lost its relevance a little bit. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Lata Venkatesh, for joining us. Prime Minister Narendra Modi today held pre-budget consultations with top business leaders of the country. The meeting was attended by Ratan Tata, Mukesh Ambani, Anand Mahindra, Gautam Adani, Anil Agarwal, Sunil Bharti Mittal, Baba Kalyani. They were all part of discussions. The Prime Minister sought uh, suggestions from the business leaders on how to boost growth and create jobs. Moving on, the center is staring at a cut in its budgetary expenditure by up to 2 lakh crore rupees this fiscal.
This translates to around 1% of India's GDP. Remember, both the government's tax revenue and divestment collections have so far been below expectations. Sapna Das, who broke the story earlier, joins us now. Sapna, what impact is the government's uh, spending cut likely to have on its fiscal projections? Well, what we are given to understand is that uh, the current uh, expenditure management uh, measures taken by the government uh, on December 27th, what they really point towards is the fact that uh, there could be an unspent amount uh, in the budget for the last quarter to the tune of 25 to 30 odd percent uh, for the last quarter of the current financial year. So basically, 25 to 30 odd percent of the Q4 expenditure budget may actually remain unutilized or unspent. Uh, those are the kind of savings that the government may actually be looking at. We are also given to understand that uh, uh, possibly the RE for a lot of ministries, a lot of departments has actually been lowered. Uh, possibly it may also be the fact that, uh, you know, uh the spending trend had picked up quite a bit in the second quarter, but the first quarter due to the elections there was a lag period and that possible lag has been felt throughout the financial year. And uh, keeping all of that in mind, it may also have been possible that the ministries and departments may not have been able to spend their entire budgeted, budgeted allocations for the current financial year and hence uh, the circular of you know lowering the spending cap for the current financial year. Clearly this will help the government try and be around that 3.3% fiscal deficit target. The November CGN numbers already show that the government has exceeded the fiscal deficit target. The question now is possibly how much will be the deviation for this financial year. So possibly these numbers of around 1.75 lakh crore to 2 lakh odd crores uh, could help uh, limit the government's uh, too much deviation from the FD number for FI20. Well, the Income Tax Department wants to now know the details about your foreign travels, your cash withdrawals of more than 10 lakh rupees and even your electricity bill. Now, the new income tax return form uh, have been released early and it comes with some key changes which have enhanced the scope of information that can be collected by the tax department. Timzi Jaipuria filed this report. Well, according to the new ITR forms that have been notified by the Central Board of Direct Taxes yesterday, now the tax department is wanting to enhance the scope of information that it gets through these return forms. According to the new forms, if we see it closely, the IT department has said that any individual who is a salaried person or who has been filing returns under the presumptive tax category will have to be very careful while filing the new ITR1 and ITR4 forms. Now let me bring uh, some of the interesting changes that are there in these forms. Firstly, it is now mandatory to give your passport number if you have a passport. Also, very clearly, if you have made a foreign travel, if you've paid electricity bills above a threshold, large banking transactions, well, you will have to file a detailed form which will be notified later, that is ITR2 and ITR3. Now, what are these thresholds? These thresholds are if you own a house, whether in a single ownership or a joint ownership, then ITR1 and ITR4 are not the forms that you will be filing. You will be filing ITR2 and ITR3. Also, if you've incurred a foreign travel of more than 2 lakh rupees in the assessment year, again, more details will be need to be given to the IT department. If you've paid electricity bill of more than 1 lakh rupees in an assessment year, if you've concluded banking transactions, whether withdrawals or uh, uh, depositing cash of more than 1 crore and above in the current account, and yes, cash withdrawals of more than 10 lakh rupees in any of the savings or current accounts, then yes, ITR 2 and 3 will be your forms and ITR 1 and 4 will no longer be your forms. Also very interestingly, whether you have an income or not and you have expenditures, expenditures to such tunes, then yes, definitely you are no longer outside the income tax ambit. Till now it was very clear that those who have an income have to file an income tax return. But if you do not have an income and you have expenditures of these uh, thresholds, then yes, definitely you have to file ITR returns which will be mandatory. Let's see what are the new, new two forms that is ITR 2 and 3. What is the further scope of action and further scope of information that the IT department is wanting you to give back to you. All right, uh, Tim C there telling us about the ITR changes which are set to take place. Moving on to politics now, the race for Delhi has officially been kicked off. Election Commission has announced the dates for the assembly polls. The voting will be held on the 8th of February, while the counting of votes will take place on the 11th of February. Voting will be held across 13,750 polling stations and the model code of conduct is effective from today. The term of the current government is set to end on the 22nd of February and a new house has to be constituted before that.
And staying with uh, news from the national capital, over 30 students and teachers were injured after a mob wearing masks, wielding sticks, rods and sledgehammers launched an attack on students of the Jawaharlal Nehru University last evening. The JNU Students Union has accused ABVP of carrying out the attack. However, ABVP has denied the allegations and has blamed JNU Students Union. The ABVP says uh, they were attacked by members of Left Unity for protesting against their efforts to force a lockdown in the university. The Delhi police has filed an FIR against unidentified people but hasn't made any arrests yet. Home Minister Amit Shah has asked Delhi Lieutenant Governor Anil Bejal to call representatives from JNU for a discussion about the incident. Students have hit the streets across the country protesting against the JNU attack. In Mumbai, protesters have gathered at the Gateway of India. In Kolkata, students at Jadapur University are at the forefront of protests. JNU students also continue to protest against last evening's rampage. The political blame game, meanwhile, continued for the second day in a row. <clears throat> ऑर्गेनाइज्ड अटैक था क्योंकि जब वो लोग मार रहे थे लोगों को नाम ले लेके मार रहे थे लोगों को आइडेंटिफाई भी कर रहे थे पर्टिकुलर एबीवीपी के कार्यकर्ता जिस रूम में है मैं जिस रूम में था हम चार लोग उस रूम में छुपे हुए थे उस रूम के दोनों तरफ के दरवाजे तोड़े खिड़की तोड़ी सारे शीशे तोड़े वी रैन फॉर आवर लाइफ लिटरली आई हैड वाई लाइफ इज रनिंग आई हैड नो आइडिया वे वी वर गोइंग It is a situation that was deliberately created by them. By whom? By whom? By the administration under the leadership of the vice chancellor. We are uh, uh, in process of identification, so obviously uh, arrests uh, are uh, in pipeline. Once we identify, किसी भी शिक्षण संस्था को राजनीति का अड्डा बनने नहीं दिया जाएगा. This is a descent into fascism. This is no longer creeping fascism. This is a rapid descent into fascism. Nowadays, I have seen that how they are torturing the students, and they are torturing the even the officers also. It is a very. I am telling you, it is very disturbing. It is not only for me, it is for all. और जिस तरीके से मैंने देखा टीवी पर तो ये तो मुझे 26 नवंबर की 26 नवंबर का जो हमला हुआ था उसकी याद आ गई. But this issue continues to rage on. In fact, my colleague Jude Sanath caught up with former Supreme Court Judge Justice Madan Lokul uh, to get his sense on the JNU rampage last night. Take a look. Well, I'm joined by Justice Lokur, of course, to get his thoughts on the protests and the aftermath. Justice Lokur, very simple. 28 students have been injured in an overnight attack. There has been widespread violence on campus. Let's remember the protests in JNU have been happening for quite a while now. But just given the graveness of these attacks, do you feel there could possibly be some amount of collusion on the part of the establishment, which has led to these attacks even as police have remained bystanders? Well, it's like this. You know, it's very difficult to say whether there has been any collusion. But I think uh, you know things are a little unclear in the sense that uh, when there was some violence in uh, Jamia, mm -hmm. the police entered, and uh, there was a lot of criticism that how did you enter Jamia without uh, the permission of the vice chancellor and so on. Mm -hmm. Now here, when there is violence in uh, JNU, mm -hmm. the police did not enter, apparently, apparently, because they did not have the permission of the vice chancellor. So I think it's a little unclear whether the permission of the vice chancellor is required or it is not required. If it is required, then what happened in Jamia was, on the face of it, totally uncalled for, illegal, unconstitutional, whatever you may wish to call it. Mm -hmm. But if the police could enter Jamia without the permission of the uh, vice chancellor, I do not see why they could not enter JNU without the permission of the vice chancellor to stop the violence. Right. So you bring up a very interesting paradox, you know, with regard to both these incidents and how they be, may have been an issue on both sides with regard to permission itself. But let's explore the aftermath, if you will, for just a bit. Just one FIR, hardly any people detained at all. Surely the police seems to be dragging its feet with regard to what it wants to do in the aftermath of the violence. So do you see some sort of conspiracy behind it? And and is there a hand uh, you know, on part of the establishment with regard to ensuring the police goes as slow as possible with regard to taking action against the goons? Yeah, well, you know, uh, conspiracy is a pretty strong word. 
Um, but yes, uh, I think the police is going slow. At least that's what I gather from uh, you know the reports that are coming in on uh, the television and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it is a little surprising that the police is going a little slow. I mean, they have the technology, you know, uh, to find out who uh, were the persons who had come and uh, attacked all the students. Right. And uh, I think more than 24 hours have gone by. You know, but still nothing seems to have happened. Right. You know, I just want to bring you up on the aftermath on the part of the establishment and the government itself. Let's explore for a bit the kind of language used in the aftermath of the attack. Clashes as opposed to attacks. The government seems to be more keen on calling, you know, the whole affair, uh, you know, a direct fallout of how JNU is too political. Also going on to say the Union, the Union Minister for Education stating that universities cannot become hubs of political activity. Do you feel it's a question of misplaced priorities as opposed to condemning the attack? The government seems to be harping on about just what should not or should happen at universities around the country. Well, I don't want to comment on, uh, you know, what the government feels. Uh, that's entirely for them to decide how to react. Uh, but uh, undoubtedly, and I don't think there can be any question about this, whatever, whatever has happened is extremely unfortunate. It should not have happened. And I think a thorough investigation is called for. The standard operating procedures with regard to the police entering, um, uh, you know, academic institutions must be laid out very, very clearly. Mm -hmm. And uh, there must be a thorough investigation to find out what's going on. You know, it's, it's, it's really shocking whatever has happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very shocking, yeah, undoubtedly. But with regard to the legality of it all, Justice, uh, the CAA, does it provisionally violate Article 14 of the Indian Constitution? And is there some sort of a grey area with regard to all of this? I believe the situation and the legality of it is more layered than it seems at least from the first look, at, from the first look itself. Well, uh, in my view, uh, the proviso that has been introduced in the, in the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, in my view, it is uh, constitutionally not valid. It violates Article 14, definitely. It may be violating other provisions of the Constitution as well. Mm -hmm. uh, to that extent, I think the uh, proviso is unconstitutional. Right. And where do you feel this could all lead from here? What do you think the fallout of all this will be? Yes, we've seen widespread protests against the act itself, not just in certain universities, but across the country, cutting across political ideologies and boundaries as well, outside, of course, the right wing. But going forward, even as violence has escalated, like in the case of JNU and, of course, the other two the universities as well, where do you see this going from here in terms of the fallout on the ground? Do you foresee more violence that, that will lie ahead? Do you feel the legal route could be taken to see some sort of, you know, some outcome with regard to the legality of the act, where do we go from here? Yeah, well, uh, I certainly hope that there is no more violence. You know, I mean, vi violence is totally unacceptable. Um, but the matter is pending in the Supreme Court. I think the uh, constitutional validity of the act is pending in the Supreme Court. And I hope the Supreme Court uh, will take it up. Uh, it's, I think it's uh, scheduled to come up on the 22nd of January. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope they take a decision uh, pretty soon. Right. Well, there you have it then. Justice Lokur clearly stating that as far as the attack itself are concerned, there is no place for violence. There should not have been any place for violence. Calling the conspiracy, though, might be a tad far-fetched. But with regard to the constitutionality of the act itself, that's something for the courts to decide. And they probably will, in due course, at least, as far as these cases come up, hearing is concerned. All right, that was Justice Madan B. Lokur.